Hey everybody, Kevin Shortell here. I wanted to put together a video for you about what I learned from the latest FHFA foreclosure prevention report. Now these reports come out on a quarterly basis um, uh, for the most part. This one came out in January 2019. Just came out uh, several weeks ago and that's the latest report that is out there. So I'm going to go through this with you and I think what you're going to get from this is an understanding of why I keep saying 2019 and 20 are going to be the years of re-performing notes but I always caution people on that as to be very careful as to what that definition of reperforming is. And, and the way I look at those as a, an investor is they're non-performing until proven otherwise. And you'll see what I mean as we progress through this report. The other thing is you'll learn some different techniques and such that you may not have heard before when it comes to loan modifications and what you can do. Uh, and the same thing as what these lenders through their servicing companies are doing. And of course, uh, appreciate you of watching this on on youtube and do subscribe to the channel if you'd like i'm going to start adding a lot more videos on the youtube channel and i'll be doing some live streaming from it as well so you may want to go ahead and click subscribe for that and uh, you can find out more about me if uh, you need to uh, kevinshortel.com is the website and also uh, please listen to my podcast show the kevin shortel show podcast i'm going to be starting a couple other podcasts for you as well and you can subscribe to those also got some great interviews on there i do some solo casts on there as well. So let's go ahead and go through this uh, latest report here in January. And um, I've taken the best parts of this and uh, made it easier for you all to understand. Actually, <laughs> for a report, <clears throat> government reports, which I read a lot of, this was fairly easy, to be honest with you. There were 14 pages, including the glossary on, on this one, which is important, by the way. So first thing here is the foreclosure prevention activities. Uh, when FHFA took over seeing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they were on a mission to prevent foreclosures. Instead of foreclosing upon millions and millions of people in the crash of the marketplace, they shifted gears and said, we can't let that happen. We have to do some things that enables people to stay in their homes and therefore, again, you know, uh, keep the homes in good condition, pay property taxes, etc. cetera. Uh, so <clears throat> that's the mission that they were on. And that's why you saw foreclosures uh, starting to go down and down and down to really the point now where they're almost insignificant in terms of numbers nationwide uh, because of all these prevention activities. So the first one that they have up there is loan modifications. And you'll see there's a little asterisk on there and that says it includes the HAMP Home Affordable Mortgage Program. It includes the HAMP permanent modifications and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But the overall trend between December uh, 2018 and January 2019, now these are month to month reports here. Uh, uh, not annualized or or anything like that, month to month. So 7,437 is what they had for loan modifications back in the month of December 2018. In January 2019, you can see that increased a little bit by 1,000 up to 8,446. So the trajectory there is loan modifications are working out for uh, most people. Now, again, there's some footnotes to that. Uh, for example, sometimes loan modifications go bad and they do mods again. If you listen to my state of the industry address on the podcast or you saw me live, you saw that I, I showed you that where uh, the, the uh, number of people going through three modifications now has increased pretty drastically. So there definitely are some people gaming the system, if you will. But nonetheless, the overall trajectory is loan modifications are working. Now, first of all, what do they mean by loan modification? So this is the glossary that comes with this report. So this is not my definition. This is the definition of FHFA. And it says loan modifications, the number of modified, renegotiated, or restructured loans regardless of performance to date under the plan, okay? So number of modified, renegotiated, or restructured loans regardless of the performance to date under the plan during the month. So this is one of those indicators when they say this loan has been modified, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's performing again. They may have just renegotiated and that's all that they did and the first person hasn't made the first payment. Some of these uh, negotiations, the people have to prove themselves before it becomes finalized. They have to make three months of payment. So again, you got to be very careful on what that definition of reperforming or uh, re, uh, or new loan modification is. It doesn't necessarily, by their own definition here, it doesn't necessarily mean 
uh, what their performance is to date. It's just that they did something during that month to modify that loan. It continues and says terms of the contract between the borrower and the lender are altered uh, with the aim of curing the delinquency 30 days or more past due. So again, just by saying it's been modified means there's been a negotiation that has been concluded here and all they did was alter something. It has nothing to do with what the performance is to date. So it's pretty important that you understand what that means. So it also means that just because the loan's been modified doesn't necessarily mean that that loan is going to continue to perform. So they get the loan, then they might package that up and resell that under a re-performing note, but it may not be the same thing that you're thinking. So I think the point is clear there. Let's talk about the HAMP permanent loan modifications and Again, terminology here is so important. I think when people hear permanent modification, I think the direct logical inclination from the consumer is, okay, so they've modified my loan and this is what my payment shall be. Consumers are very focused on payment, not as much on interest rate and term and everything else. They see permanent modification. They go, great, this is now my new monthly payment. That is not the case. That is not the case at all because once again, it comes down to the definition. So if you go to making home affordable, which is what this HAMP program is underneath, this is the government uh, website here, it says this, Again, I just cut and paste uh, what they wrote on their website, and you can go check out the, uh, the website, makinghomeaffordable.gov. It says this, you should understand what the new interest rate on the modified loan is, whether your interest rate will increase at some point, and what the new term of the loan is, 30 years, comma, 40 years, question mark. <laughs> Cut and paste directly from their site. So yes, you will see HAMP permanent loan modifications that were stretched all the way out to 40 years. That's right. So somebody might have been in a house for five years. Uh, so they, they started with a 30-year loan. Now they got 25 years left. They ran into some problems. The loan's been modified under HAMP. Now they have a 40-year loan. By stretching that loan out, and typically what they do with that is lower the interest rate, that lowers the person's payment. Now the assumption by the consumer, I, and I'm purely speculating here, but come on, let's think of the logic here. Most consumers are signing this paperwork, have no idea. They're thinking, what is my payment? And because it says permanent modifications, that's what they understood. The reality is most of the loans that they did under HAMP, <clears throat> excuse me, start to go up after the fifth year. So sure, for five years, their monthly payment was very low. Their interest payments, sometimes the interest rates were moved all the way down to 2%. Well, five years down the road, all of a sudden that goes to 3%, then 4%, then 5%. And some of these loans were actually written where it goes back to the original interest rate or taps out at some uh, government maximum. So there's been a uh, re loan modifications on a lot of these hamps because people simply didn't understand that and that became a big problem uh, i believe the number will come up a little bit later on but in my mind i'm thinking with somewhere around 63 percent had to be modified again so that's a big big uh number okay so that's one thing how does that affect us as uh, real estate investors real estate note investors they're going to modify these loans. They're going to package them up. They're going to sell them on the big auctions. This is already happening, by the way. Just go look at Fannie Mae on their website. You'll see they've already had two sales. Freddie Mac just had a sale of non-performing, but mostly, when you look at the numbers, re-performing. Okay, but what does that exactly mean? Okay, so <clears throat> that's what we have with the uh, the HAMP programs. And uh, the next one up there is repayment plans. Okay, so we have loan modifications, which we talked about, and then there's repayment plans. And you can see the repayment plans going from a really a, a, a 13 months sp a spread in December 2018, 2400, uh, January 2400, per, essentially off by about three loans, which is pretty crazy when you, when you think of it. What is then a repayment plan? Well, again, if we go back to their glossary, not mine, repayment plans, an agreement between the servicer and a borrower that gives the borrower a defined period 
period of time to reinstate the mortgage by paying normal, regular payments plus an additional agreed upon amount in repayment of the delinquency. Okay, so you'll notice it says, first of all, an agreement between the servicer and the borrower. So Fannie Mae does not service their own loans. That's what the banks do. So most of what's going on, what the consumer sees is the bank is working with them and they think the bank owns the note. The bank doesn't own the note, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac does. The bank is simply acting as the servicer of that note. They're collecting principal interest, taxes and insurance, handling escrow, making sure the payments are made, following up on foreclosures and everything else, just like a regular servicing company. That's what banks do for Fannie and Freddie. So it's between them, which really means Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have given the servicers guidelines to say, go work this out. Let's see what we can do. So sometimes it happens where somebody lost their job. They're now working again. And look at the employment numbers. Okay, there, There's a lot more people working. We're hitting record numbers of people working today. So it's a very likely scenario. People lost a job. Now they're working again. They can afford to make the payment, but they have such a delinquency, they don't know if they should pay or not because they know just by making a payment doesn't prevent foreclosure when you have two years of delinquencies. Okay, so they're a little bit stuck. So this repayment plan simply comes in and the server looks at their information and says, okay, this borrower, uh, we'll give them a period of time to reinstate the loan. So make some regular payments here. Prove to us that you can do that. Normally that's around three months. So you make three monthly payments. Show us that you can handle that. Then after the three months, we're going to have you agree upon some additional amount here that's going to start repaying that delinquency. Okay, so obviously that's not going to work for every borrower, and that's why they break that out on that category there. So more and more people do are doing the loan modifications, but you had about 2,400 people per month that are doing these repayment plans, and that what that that's what that is all about. The next one is the forbearance plans, and uh, again, pretty. Consistent. When you look at December 2018, 2298, January 2019, 2009, so just you know a couple hundred uh, difference between that that year on a month to month basis. There, uh, what does the forbearance plan? mean forbearance forbear your for giving your delaying if you will uh, here's what their definition is forbearance plans an agreement between the servicer and the borrower to reduce or suspend the monthly payments for a defined period of time okay so they essentially come in and say look we're going to try to help you out here uh, you have an arrearage account. Uh, what they left off in their definition is normally this forbearance means also that uh, you're not going to enforce the acceleration clause in the mortgage uh, to foreclose upon them. You're saying we're going to hold off on the foreclosure even though we have the right as the lender to foreclose upon you, we are going to forbear that. We are go not going to delay that. Okay. This is going to be a short-term delay for you to prove to us that we can do some other loan modification. So these are temporary plans. Let me go back to their definition again. An agreement between the servicer and the borrower to reduce or suspend the monthly payments for a defined period of time. So... For right now, to stop foreclosure, show us that, you know, maybe you, uh, 80 pay 80% 80 of what your payments normally are. Make those payments to us to show us that you have the ability to do that while we're working out some other agreement uh, with you. So they might do that or they might just say, okay, we're going to stop the foreclosure, stop the payments right now. Let's figure out what is going to work for both parties here. Okay, so there's flexibility within this. So again, an agreement between the servicer and the borrower to reduce or suspend monthly payments for a defined period of time after which the borrower resumes regular monthly payments and pays additional money towards the delinquency to bring the account current or works with the servicer to identify a permanent solution such as a loan modification, short sale, uh, or short sale to address the delinquency. Okay, So again, forbearance plans are short term. Okay, 
We've identified a problem here. We have a cooperative borrower. Let's see what we can work out. So it might, again, include them saying, don't make payments for us right now while we're working this out, uh, or make some payments. We'll reduce the payments. Prove to us that you have the ability to pay, and let's work to some kind of permanent solution. If they're looking at somebody who doesn't really have an income right now or not enough income, they might suspend uh, suspend payments and just say, look, we really, it's looking like we have to go to a short sale. Let's try to have you sell this property and uh, we'll, we would be willing to uh, settle for less than what we are actually owed on the loan through the short sale. So again, if somebody has a house that's worth a hundred thousand and maybe they owe $110,000 and uh, you know Fannie Mae through their servicer agrees that hey sell the house for seventy grand, uh, sell the house for eighty grand, and we'll forgive all the rest of the debt. Okay, that's the four abeyance plan. So there's a lot of flexibility in those type of plans, and uh, you can see it's pretty pretty popular. So obviously the most popular is some kind of a loan modification program, but repayment plans for a certain number, and also for abeyance plans work very well. You as a note investor can do the same thing. Uh, forbearance can be pretty darn good option. For example, if you're buying a property, a note on a property, a non-performing loan, and uh, winter's almost here, coming up upon us, something like that. It might make sense in trying to do a workout with that delinquent borrower to do some form of a forbearance plan where they stay in the house. Because sometimes in the winter, I mean, if you're in the Midwest and you bought, you know, a, a, a note backed by a $70,000 property, something like that, do you want that to be vacant during the winter? Or would you rather have somebody living in there during the winter, even though they're not paying? And uh, if you really think about that, I think you'll agree that in almost all cases, I'd rather have somebody living in there, even if they're not making payments. But let's put something in action. Right, so let's get them under a forbearance agreement. Where during those winter months, to to play along with my example, we're at least working out some kind of permanent modification. Okay, so we're, we've opened that door of communication where we can uh, do that. And repayment plans work very, very well uh, as an individual note buyer. When you buy that note and there's a delinquency on there, you don't have to forgive all of that if they can show the ability to make the payments, right? So uh, do a repayment plan, and now they're making two payments. They're paying the, the first mortgage moving forward, and now there's been an agreement on what additional payment they need to pay to you to make up all of that uh, uh delinquent uh, uh, payments in the past, or maybe just a part of that. Maybe you combine some of the, say, look, you guys are behind $30,000 on this loan. We need to do a plan here. Start making the payment again. I won't foreclose on you, but uh, you're going to have to pay me back 20000 of that 35000 bucks on a separate plan. Okay, so a lot of different ways that we can do these, these loan modifications. It's not all just about, although it's more common, as you can see on these numbers, just stretching out loans, lowering interest rates, uh, lowering payments, anything like that. There's a lot of other creative ways that we can work with people to, again, good give them a good deal. They save their house after all. You're saving their house when you do these prevention activities, but you also make sure that you maintain your risk levels and your profit margins. The other one you see on there is charge-offs in lieu, which is kind of a new one, right? We, we've all heard of deed in lieu. This is not the same thing. This is a charge-offs in lieu. Okay. Now, this is used very infrequently. So you can see in the January 2019, uh, they only did this. Fannie and Freddie combined, by the way, is all these numbers. There was only 107 of these done nationwide on Fannie and Freddie uh, loans, prevention activities. So that's not a lot uh, at all because it's rare circumstances. Again, if you look at their definition, a charge-offs in lieu of foreclosure, a delinquent loan for which collection efforts or legal actions against the borrower are agreed to be not in the enterprises, that's Fannie and Freddie, best interest because of reduced property value or low outstanding balance or presence of certain environmental hazards. So it's a very rare situation where they would do something like this. But you can imagine if somebody's got a $70,000 home and they only owe 
ten thousand bucks on this. You know, Fannie and Freddie through their servicers are finally starting to look at that and go, well, how much money are we going to spend to try to get? either monthly payments on this $10,000 loans or a lump sum of back or some kind of, you know, we can't really do a short because then the people are having to, to leave their, their house and they're giving up, you know, a lot of equity. It doesn't make sense. What are we to do? Well, it used to be, well, we're just going to foreclose and, and, and move forward. So instead, what they've done here is the servicer charges off the mortgage debt. In other words, they just write it off. We're not going to collect on, on this. We're not going to demand payments or anything like that. We're just going to let the per person stay in the property, but we will maintain this as a lien on that borrower's property. That way, when they go to sell the property, we'll get paid back because they can't sell the property when it has a clouded title. So they're giving up on collections, essentially. They're saying, ha, just let the person stay in the house. Forget about even trying to collect this, but we're going to maintain or create our lien status on this property because someday down the road, when they go to sell this property, we're going to get a phone call that says, hey, they need to pay off this out of the proceeds of the sale and they'll get their money back that way. So very, very infrequently that they would use that. Okay, some more interesting information that uh, uh, was in this report. Uh, this chart, <clears throat> percentage of total foreclosure prevention action. So all those actions that we just talked about there, um, these are the percentage of what they did with their portfolios. Again, this chart shows all both uh, the enterprises, right, Fannie and Freddie. So back in January 2018, you'll notice that forbearance plans were much stronger versus January 2019. They went from 36% for uh, forbearance plans all the way down to uh, 5% uh, in August, September, and then it started increasing again and went down a little bit to get to 15% in January 2019. Makes sense. You know, there was still 2018, still a lot of properties uh, going through recovery early in that year. We're looking at, you know, again, end of 2017, starting in, in 18. And um, it, it made sense that there were still a lot more people facing uh, the reality of foreclosure. So let's do a forbearance. So let's do something to work out there. Uh, you'll see charge offs in lieu 1%, 0%, 1%. You know, so again, that's very, very small amount. The Home Saver Advance Program, Fannie Mae, that was a short term loan for somebody to catch up. They stopped that program in 2010. So that's why you're going to see all zeros on that one. Uh, repayment plans. Repayment plans up on the top there, 10% of uh, the loans in, in January 2018, again, went on a little rise uh, and then started coming down again and landed at 18%. So again, still, you know, even though it's a little smaller, it, it's actually grown in, in popularity, which makes sense once again, because we have more people working, more people uh, able to afford their homes, uh, their, their, their monthly payments, I should say. And um, it's a better alternative for them. Do a repayment plan, start paying back that, that other debt, helps their credit and everything else. Loan mods on the bottom. Uh, it says 49% back in January 2018. You can see that grew very quickly up to uh, August 2018, where 80% were all loan modifications. Everybody sees that number. Look at forbearance and that August 2018 as well. Went down to 5% for banks plans. So loan mods were much more popular at that. And then they've decreased. They're about 62% of that. So in January 2019, 62%, overwhelming majority, uh, were loan modifications. And then you had uh, next repayment plans and then forbearance plans. And that should all make sense. So that was 96% in total for all foreclosure prevention actions. Then they have what they call home retention, uh, excuse me, home forfeiture actions. And that is your short sales and deed in lieu. So again, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, deed in lieu stands for deed in lieu of foreclosure, where essentially the person just signs the property over to the lender. We do this all the time in the note business. If we buy non-performing notes and the person simply cannot afford to make those payments, we don't have to foreclose upon them and put that, put that on their credit and everything else. The alternative is they just sign the deed over, deed in lieu of foreclosure. And that is best 
in almost all cases for both parties, both parties be being the borrower and the lender. And just saying, look, you don't need the foreclosure uh, on your record. It's going to be there for, I think it's seven years. You don't need all that. You don't have to go through that. Uh, we'll you know, just sign the deed over to us and we, we will forgive all of the debt and they walk away. And that's, uh, you know, a good thing for that. So short sales, to contrast, short sales means that the lender is willing to accept less than the total amount that they are owed. But again, that can make a lot of sense in some cases where people owe more than their house is worth. They're not able to sell it because of that. And we still have, by the way, uh, 2.3 million. The last numbers of uh, loans are underwater, the, the, meaning that the, uh, the, the borrower owes more money than the house is worth. So just to use simple numbers again, I think I said that they owe $110,000 and the house is worth $100,000, but in their market, they can sell it very quickly for eighty. dollars if the lender is willing to accept $80,000 as payment in full and forgive the difference between the $80,000 and the $110,000 that's actually owed there, uh, so $30,000, great. That's a short payoff or a short sale, if you will. And, and those can be very good, especially for note buyers. You might, you might buy a non-performing note, that same note, let's say, $110,000 is what they owe, the house is worth $100,000. Uh, so you might have purchased that note for forty grand. Let me ask you a question. If somebody came along and said, I'll buy that house, but I'm only going to pay $80,000 and I'll pay $80,000 in cash, and you're entitled because you're owed $110,000, you're entitled to that full $80,000? And all you have to do is forgive the other 30 to the delinquent borrower. Would you take it? <laughs> of course. You paid $40,000. You're getting $80,000 back. Of course you would do that. So it can work out in many cases too. But again, short sales and deed and lose are going to be smaller percentage of the, of the time. And collectively, they make up 4%, which is your 100% of activities. A couple other interesting things to note here. The top five reasons for delinquencies. What is happening? Why are people? Why did people fall behind on their mortgage payments? Well, back in January 2018, you can see that the highest response was curtailment of income. Okay, so they were making less money. Maybe their hours got cut. Um, who knows? Uh, maybe their wages went went down. Whatever it is, they lost some of their income. Um, I'm sure that also probably includes that uh, you know a divorce or something like that, where where you know the breadwinner's out of the picture, perhaps. One of the spouses has left and that cut the income in half. I'm sure that curtailment of income includes that as well. So January 2018, that was the number one reason for delinquency. And you can see that that reason has been steady all the way through Ju January 2019. Uh, it's up a little bit, 24% now versus 22. But you can see throughout that time frame, it, it remained pretty steady. So that's the number one causation really of delinquencies. What has creeped up behind that is excessive obligations. That went from 19% and now has grown up to 23%. Excessive obligations. Uh, people let their debt get up too high. Uh, so, you know, the credit card bills, and I bet you the biggest part of this is also student debt. Now, you might be thinking, well, student debt that's on the student not the you know the where they don't even own a home yet how could that be remember a lot of times parents sign the promissory notes for the student debt and that's been kind of ignored when when they say student debt you're just thinking some college kid is now out there struggling you know they get their first job and they're struggling uh, to pay rent and everything else because they have this student loan debt but this same thing has happened to the parents of many of these students because they're on the hook as well. They co-signed for that loan. So now their obligations have gone up as well. A lot of banks got out of the lending business when it comes to mortgages. Non-banks do by far more loans than banks do today. Banks are looking for alternatives and that became business loans and credit cards. And people got access to easy credit again. Their debt obligations have gone up. 
Okay, so more people working, but more access to credit sometimes leads to more uh, obligations, and that can get out of hand. So you can see that that has grown, and it's almost equal to, if you will, curtailment of income. So it makes sense, right? Uh, either It's either lack of income or excess of debt are the two biggest reasons. So when you combine those two, there's that's 47%, basically half of, of the, the reason for delinquency, right? Not enough income or cutting back on income, again, for job cutting hours or divorces and simply having excess debt obligations. And again, student debt is absolutely a part of that. Unemployment, 6%, and that's been pretty, uh, pretty steady. Uh, throughout illness of uh, principal mortgage or uh, or family member uh, so again that probably ties into the same thing of now we've lost an income okay because of an illness and uh, or a family member and they're helping the family member out something like that um, or paying the debt of that family member um, and by family you know it could be son daughter something like that so there's some kind of an illness which is what taking money away from their uh, their regular income uh, and also sometimes if they can't pay the bill what happens a debt obligation uh, pops up for that so they kind of go a little hand in hand there I would uh, argue for that but the illness was the triggering effect of that curtailment of income marital uh, difficulties they put two and three percent uh, there and again they don't really define what they mean by marital difficulties because I would have to think that uh, divorce has more of an impact uh, on that uh, difficulties uh, uh, who knows? Does that uh, divorce fall under that or not? I don't know. Difficulty doesn't sound final uh, to me. But when people are separated, uh, that sort of thing, when people are having uh, uh, challenges like that, of course, that affects uh, overall income. So I think some of these other things are uh, unemployment, illness, and, and marital difficulties really uh, are maybe the causation that leads to uh, the curtailment of income and the excessive obligation. So that all should make, uh, uh, make sense. So as note, investors, when we're looking at and we're probing and trying to figure out how we can work with somebody to keep them in their home and do a loan modification or a forbearance type of a program uh, or who knows deed lieu or, or short sale part of the note business as I always say this business is about the numbers and it's about the story finding out what their situation is might lead you to a better cure, you know, and that sometimes takes a little bit of uh, probing. And then you find out, well, you know, I, uh, my hours got cut back or we had family problems or we had an illness. And, uh, but, um, you know, now we're able to pay this down. We're able to pay that down. You know, you can start to work and, and, and put together a, a much more structured loan mod uh, or forbearance or repayment plan based upon what their what their story is and working with within that so keep that in mind as you're working out these these loans all right so in total then to wrap all of this up they have a nice little summary page on here since the full first full quarter of conservatorship that was in the fourth quarter of 2008 and what that means is that's essentially when Fannie and Freddie went bankrupt okay? they simply didn't have enough money uh, and we're taking back all these loans, you know, so their income stopped on all, all these loans. And again, we, we had the crash in 2008 by fourth quarter. They were done. It, it was, it, it was very quick. Conservatorship is a, a term used in bankruptcy. So technically, yes, uh, Fannie and Freddie did not declare bankruptcy, but they were put under conservatorship, which is what you do when you're in bankruptcy. So a uh, pretty, uh, a thin line that they had there, uh, if you will. So for for all intents and purposes, they were bankrupt. And under conservatorship, that's where the FHFA came in to oversee what they were doing, um, you know, uh, to recorrect the, the bad lending practices and bad purchases and all those other things uh, they oversee. So since the first full quarter of conservatorship, which was fourth quarter 2008, combined complete foreclosure prevention activities, uh, actions, I should say, total 4.3, let's call it million. More than half of these actions are permanent loan modifications. And a lot of those, by the way, were HAMP that have already redefaulted. Okay, and some pretty good, uh, pretty good numbers, uh, by the way. So 
Repayment plans, uh, you're looking at 3.6 when you add in the short sales and deeds in lieu that they have done. Uh, and look, boy, look at short sales back in 2016, 17.7, right? Made sense. Property values were still lower. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of, of uh, equity in those deals. A lot more people were underwater with, the, with their loans. So short sale. And then uh, went way down uh, short sales. Look at that. From 17,716 in 2016 down to uh, January 2019 where it was only 374 loans. Wow. Same thing with deeds and loo. Not as drastic. 8,000 down to 200. Uh, look at the loan mods, 123,000 in 2016 in one month, uh, or no, I'm sorry, that's in the year 2016. And then January, uh, that one month, 8,446. So we're seeing a, a little fluctuations through there. All right. To date, um, 2 million on the loan mods. So the biggest category by far repayment structures, then forbearances, uh, the home seller programs out, uh, by the way, I, I think I already mentioned that. And then we've got our charge offs. Excellent. So those are all the numbers for you. We're not out of inventory yet. We're not out of the market uh, is still recovering. We're not out of this uh, just yet. In fact, here's in the same report, they did uh, just a brief mention of mortgage performance and uh, number of loans. December uh, 2018, that were less than 60 days delinquent, 364,000. January 2019, 337,000. So improvement, but again, do not think that we are out of the overall situation. The 60 days delinquents, again, look at the numbers, pretty darn close. Foreclosure starts, pretty darn close. Third party foreclosure, uh, third party and foreclosure sales, pretty steady. Uh, so we are not out of this just yet. You can see the percentages. Yes, the percentages are are down from what they they were, especially on the seriously uh, delinquent uh, loans. But that makes sense. The new loans that they started putting out past all the bad lending days have less of a delinquency problem, as it should be. They're not writing, um, you know, have a pulse loan, stated income, no doc loans. They're not doing those anymore. Or wait a minute, they just started those back up again, didn't they? <laughs> they hadn't been for a long time, and look what's happened. Now there are loans that people can have 520 credits, credit scores, put nothing down. They even now have no doc loans. Be careful out there, but that's what they're doing. It's not going to be good for the overall economy because eventually. Those loans will go bad if we have a trip up in the economy and all of a sudden people aren't making money again. What happens? Again, we could go back to those five uh, top reasons. I don't think we need to look at that slide again, but if they lose a little bit of an income, delinquencies are going to go up. If their debt gets too high, delinquencies are going to go up. What's happening to student debt? Advancing crazy. Uh, what's happening to credit card debt now? Going up very, very st steady right now. So we are not uh, out of this yet. Property values are peaking out. So we just have to be aware of the marketplace and we have to have the ability to buy right. The notes is the best space still to do that. Now, I'm a big believer in combining notes with real estate as far as entry strategies and exit strategies. And I think that's where everybody needs to be. So hope you enjoyed this uh, video. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Check out my podcast. I think you're really going to enjoy it. I do some great interviews with people in the industry. Uh, I um, uh, do some solo casts talking about the industry, what's happening with, uh, within that. I think you'll enjoy it. It's called The Kevin Shortell Show. You can find it on iTunes or wherever you get your, your podcast. I also have a new website that should be out soon, depending upon when you hear this. Uh, should be out in, um, well, let's call it the end of May. Uh, and uh, it, it will have a whole transcri uh, transcription of the podcast as well if you prefer to, uh, to read those on the website, which is www.kevinshortel, that's S-H-O-R-T-L-E dot com. Thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and look forward to putting another presentation together for you soon.